disruptive in our own unique way, but I think many times there are situations where either we need to be disruptive upstream or parallel or downstream. What are some good strategies or just some considerations for providing those disruptions in different directions? I think as leaders, a lot of the times we're the ones putting in something that's gonna go down somewhere. But what about those opportunities where the disruption needs to go up before it can come down? Great question. Okay, I'll take that one. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a few thoughts. Uh, first of all, I mean, disruption by definition is playing where someone else isn't playing or doesn't want to play. So, you know, getting it to go up is a little bit more difficult. But let's, let's say you have a disruptive idea and you're trying to figure out how to have it um, go out throughout the firm. Um, I'd say first thing is that it's really important to figure out how to socialize your idea. I mean, one of the things I think that often happens is that we have an idea, but we don't, um, I don't speak IT, so I can't communicate my idea to IT. And IT doesn't speak marketing, so marketing, so they can't communicate their idea to marketing. So one of the things that we have to do is we need to learn different languages. We need to be able to talk in a language that the people that we need to have buy-in can understand. It's translation, if you speak a foreign language, you know exactly what I'm talking about, but it's something that I think is really important. The second thing is, is that sometimes we think of disruption, and um, you'll appreciate this example. Um, I think we sometimes think of David and Goliath, right? David is disruptive and agile, and Goliath is oafish and awful, right? But if you think about it, one of my favorite images is, how many of you know who Bugsy Moogs is? Okay, basketball player, 5'6", right? He, had, he was on a team with um, Alonzo Mourning, who was six foot ten. But guess what? It wasn't David versus Goliath. It was David and Goliath, and they had a winning team. And so one of the things you want to do is, as you socialize your idea, think of it in the framework of, okay, I'm socializing a David type of idea, but Goliath is on my team. So how do I talk in a language that Goliath can understand me so that we can move forward? You know, if you come up with a lot of ideas, you really need to have somebody, hopefully in your organization, but if not, find one at home, uh, who you can bounce those ideas off of, who will help you uh, kind of decide if you have a lot of them, uh, which are the ones that are worth pursuing, and what do you have to do to kind of make them more socializable, uh, sort of um, putting the uh, gloss on them so they'll slide through uh, faster. And by the way, before you do that, you really need to decide, are you willing to give up an idea that you may want to own and give it over to a team? Because in any organization, a team is going to have much more power uh, than just an individual. So do you want to make this idea part of a larger and larger and larger team until it, it permeates through the whole organization? Um, or uh, do you want to be TO and just be the rock star? That's, that probably won't work well. Poor T.O. Poor T.O. <laughs> I, really, I really like your question. Um, I think when you think about going, moving uh, some type of disruptive idea up, a couple of key things, um, some of us learn this the hard way, because we tend to talk the language that makes sense to us. So when you think about being disruptive um, and heading north with that idea, um, think a level up from, in less detail, more value, right? So if you're going to go in and you're going to present something, I, I mean, these are old um, silly ways to say it, but kind of a hit it and quit it. Have your elevator pitch ready so that you're not necessarily explaining from how you begin this process to how you end this process, but you're saying this is a process that's unique, it fills an underserved area, and this is the value that we'll get out of that. I would stop and listen to that. But if you wanted to tell me the 20 ways that we were to have to go to get to that, I, you'd lose me. And I think you'd lose most people that you want to have that conversation with, especially when you start taking it from a conversation between you and I to somebody who's in a position of either making a decision that's going to be profitable or not profitable. So um, being very organized and succinct is important. And I think also um, being exceptionally confident about your idea. Because if, if I press you and I can find a hint of doubt in your conversation, it's not baked enough yet for me to consider the risk associated with me taking it on. 
So even if somebody stumps you a little, use your poker face and make sure that you are on target with your confidence. And, and you know, I think what you'll find is that when you have the right idea, as you said, it, most ideas are iterative in nature. So you don't have to have the nuts and the bolts completely put together. You have to see the underserved area and find the uniqueness associated with a solution that will fill it. And then with a smart team around you, once that idea has been bought into, the rest of the components can be filled in. That's a great question. It's a great way to think about things. Awesome. Okay, we have time for one more question. Oh. Maybe two, we'll see. Okay. Uh, what I find that works well for me is uh, to bring my ideas in a very uh, transparent and open way and not really wanting uh, the ownership of the idea. What, what, what matters most is that the idea travels and more and more people, uh, you know, adhere to it. So that's what I find that works best. What worked worst for me in the past was when I wanted to push something in a strategic way. This is not the right way for me to do things. I'm not good at that. Some people are, but it never worked for me because people kind of see your intent, your personal intent. And once that is seen, you're not getting anywhere. As soon as you put something out there that can be useful by everybody, then I start hearing words that I'm preaching, you know, for the last year. People start talking the same language, and then I see that, okay, there might be something, an opening there to do, uh, to carry on. I think that's awesome. When I, when I just think about myself from a team perspective, uh, whether it's even playing sports or in business, it's sort of that same concept. When it's about you, the individual, people are more, much more resistant than when you make it about the team. So if that helps to apply, I think that's, that was a great comment. We have time for one more question. Did you, um, Jenny? Jenny and Gina? Um, he had his hand up over here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Matt Bosco. Um, my, my question center is more um, around risk and, and organization. What, I'm, what I find, in, and I, I'm probably older than you, so I've been around a lot uh, long enough to see and, and experience that being disruptive is, is in the nature of technology. It, it's, it's, otherwise, technology doesn't, doesn't evolve and the, the evolution, you know, the, the velocity of the, the evolution that we've seen is fantastic. So we all understand that, but what I'm, what I'm concerned about is when you're introducing uh, disruption, uh, and, and of course it's always intended to be positive, the organizational variables that come into play kind of stump me because uh, in small organizations, they're ready to adapt, they're, they're very nimble, uh, they'll allow you to disrupt more easily. But the problem I find is that as the disruption gets embraced, the, the appetite for what it costs to adopt that disruption starts to get lower and lower and lower. In larger organizations, disruption is met with a brick wall most of the time right up front because there's less of an inclination to change at the very beginning, although the, the disruption would be very beneficial at some point in time. In both instances, there's risk to the individual that's introducing the disruption. In smaller organizations, you might be riding this wave and all of a sudden, bang, it stops. And the risk to you, personal, can be significant. In larger organizations where you can conceivably be very successful, you get hit with the risk of frustration. And so, you, you know, the risk is more to the organization and losing someone that can potentially be very valuable. So, being long-winded as I usually am and Bridget knows, um, the question is, what, you know, what are the organizational variables that, and what, what does someone look for when they're looking to introduce uh, change or disruption? What organizational variables need to be uh, taken into account and in, in assessing what your risk is and in introducing and what level of disruption you really want to pursue. 
bring up a really great a great point, and and when I'd love to hear hear what you have to say this, but what you're really talking about is that all organizations, this all all innovation has this S curve. It's just that what's the length of the runway that you have to fight in order to get the lift off, which generally in the larger, less nimble type of companies, which are going to be the established ones. You have much more to get past. First of all, there are the politics of it. Uh, there are the, uh, your bu the budget you need to make that happen may actually be too small to get noticed at the level at which you need to get approval. On the other hand, when you're dealing with a startup, and I've been uh, now running a startup for, we're in our 13th year of startup, and I've run other startups before, our startup is, what's the risk? If somebody has a great idea, then it's riskier for me to say no, you know, than it is because I might lose them, because that's the kind of people they are. You know, we all have our risk, to, uh, our risk tolerance, but also our risk enjoyment. You know, if if you are pretty um, patient, then even in the largest company, you will trudge down that long runway. And then the rewards will be much more, much more doable. Um, if that isn't to your liking and you have a much, let's just say you're more impatient, like I am, uh, you're, you're probably much more likely to be a startup. So do a startup and then get bought by SAP. It's another idea. Uh, you know, it's, you'll accomplish the same thing, but it, it will be more aligned with who you are and the way that you want to contribute to the larger world. So it will make so much more sense for you. But am I right about S-curves? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> Go ahead. Matt, I think from an organizational perspective, because um, every organization frustrates creative, hardworking people sometimes, right? Even, even when an organization is on its best intention, um, it's, there to, it's, it's there to drive profits for shareholders and to become more competitive and entrenched in its marketplace, right? And that doesn't always align with the goals of some of the people that can take it there. So there's this interesting uh, conflict that can happen. And when you look at, at the challenges that come from an organizational perspective, uh, it's not as simple as I'm going to suggest, but we do this within ASUG. We look at disruption as a life cycle. And um, we're in constant need of filling our pipeline with new disruptive ideas because you guys have to be disruptors, so we have to help you stay ahead of the curve, right? But you can't consume as much disruption as on our best day we can come up with. And you're still probably trying to consume the most recent programs that we've introduced. So you, the organization has to be mindful that people can only consume and begin to adopt things at a certain pace. So you have to keep great ideas sometimes on a back burner, and there has to be some appropriate investment to determine if it makes sense to move it forward. And of course, um, just like you know, when my child brings, they're 20 and 22 now, so I'm remembering fonder days, but when they would bring those pictures that I didn't know what the heck they were home, and uh, when they told me, I said, this is the most beautiful whatever that just was, and put it on the refrigerator. I do believe this is the most pretty flower I've ever seen in my life. I believe that because I'm their mother. You probably believe that as a disruptor because it's your idea. The organization may not necessarily see it as that pretty flower. They might see it as a really neat idea that needs to be parked right here. More incubation is necessary. You know. So I think the thing that you need to do is consider staying the course from a confidence perspective, or as Janice said, considering if that doesn't match with where you are, uh, you know, consider moving to a, another location where you can be more disruptive. But from an organization's perspective, you can't be irresponsible about uh, taking in the best ideas and constantly launching that because how can your consumer base ever keep up with it? You, things have to become sticky. Things have to, from a brand perspective, evolve. And that can only happen when you put as much time into its life as you did into its launch which might delay the great ideas that are behind it. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't have a great pipeline and you shouldn't move that in a fluid fashion, but as a disruptor, you have to be patient that the organization is being as thoughtful about the ideas that are out there as the ones that are filling that pipeline. Awesome. Okay, Gina. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a few last words. 
Um, our panelists will be uh, concluding our book signing and photo signing. So for those of you who are a little bit early as we were running to get Dr. J's books, they are here. So if you um, had the first signing but you'd like to get Dr. J's, please join us. Uh, we'll be here till 1 o'clock to sign uh, up in the corner there. I want to thank you again, Lisa, Whitney, Bridget, and Dr. J for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our session. Uh, we'll be following up uh, by email with all of you to get your input on today's session, but also your ideas, you know, how, where could we take this in a new direction as you continue to participate in Leadership 2.0 activities. Thank you and I hope you have a great um, visit in Orlando.